Hi, um, first and foremost, I hope everybody is safe and sound. And my name is Jaime Botello, and I work for Riot Games, part of Riot Direct team. Our team is responsible for the global network infrastructure in terms of uh, the backbone and how we connect players in, into games. Um, for more than 25 years, I've been a hardcore network engineer, you know, a CLI kind of junkie. And the, um, during my career, I started working with ISPs. Then I moved to Cisco, where I spent most of my career. Uh, from there, I moved to Microsoft. And, and the last five, almost six years now, um, I've been working for Riot Games. Um, since I joined Riot Games, my main passion has always been uh, figure out or thinking about new paradigms and how we can manage this infrastructure. Um, as you can imagine, part of that journey started with basically writing scripts to make my life easier. Um, and it, just, it was just last year when we decided to consolidate our network with one single vendor and upgrade this one. Uh, we decided to see if we can um, come up with some ideas how we can manage this new infrastructure with new paradigms. My goal of this presentation is basically to walk you through that, through that journey and maybe share one thing or two about what we believe uh, help us you know, succeed in this journey. Um, but before that, I would like to share with you a little bit about Riot. Um, we develop, publish, and operate um, League of Legends. It's a very competitive game with millions of hours a month uh, and a very easy, with a very impressive eSport scene. Uh, just last year, during the the World Championship, we were having more than 100 million views, including a peak time of 44 million during the World Ch uh, Champions Finals. Um, so, as you can imagine, this has become kind of a, a a thing for a lot of a lot of uh, internet users, where they just watch this competitive game and they enjoy and they share with their favorite, for their favorite teams and players. Um, but for some time now, Riot has been trying to add more games to for our players and for our fans. Uh, and we just started uh, very recently by releasing um, what we call a, a, a prom-based strategy game, which is his name is um, Team Fight Tactics. And then we proceed with a card game. And these two based on League of Legends universe, which makes a lot of sense for fans. Uh, and just last year, we, uh, sorry, last June, we released Valorant, which is uh, a, a, a tactical character based first person shooter. Uh, with Valorant in particular, uh, Riot went very aggressively in terms of the requirements and, uh, on the network, in terms of latency and packet loss. Uh, we basically are targeting that all players can have an experience of latency around 35 milliseconds or less in, in all major regions, okay? And we also deliver what a very high performance servers with, I'm talking about with tick rate of 128, when, you know, normally you will see 64 before at top and then way below that in a lot of the games that people play today, like Call of Duty, etc. cetera. So, um, so as, as you can imagine, uh, and you can see, I mean, competitive is in our DNA. So in order to provide the best experience possible, they never play a major role. Um, it was during 2014-15 when Riot decided, hey, how can we improve this experience? And Riot came with this idea of what about if we build a better internet for the game? And we end having around, as today, around 32 pops globally. Um, with, you know, connected to more than 300 ISPs with more than 2,500 EBGP sessions. Uh, as you can imagine, uh, network this size require uh, supporting multi multi game traffic. Maybe there's have to be a better way how we manage this. And during that process, we came with this idea of how we manage this as infrastructure as code. I mean. At the end, Riot is a software company. If you think about it, we already have continuous integration pipelines. We already have a GitHub internally, you know, for source control. So it makes a lot of sense. So we decide to say, okay, and you know, talk with our leadership and say, 
this is what we think right drain networks code means. And, and what it is, is basically where we define and manage right drain network infrastructure via machine friendly declaratives using software version control and delivering changes via continuous integration and continuous delivery pipelines. In other words, basically we define our network configuration using structured data, YAML or JSON. In our case, we select YAML and we call this a configuration network device properties. It can be the BGP neighbor IP, the IP of the interface, the M2O interface, all these are basically properties. We track them using version control and if any of these properties change, that trigger a deployment of the new property value to the network devices via a Riot CI a continuous integration pipeline. In our case, Riot used Jenkins. So this is kind of the, in a very high level, what defined Riot Direct was code. And people start liking the idea. But then we say, okay, what are the key design principles we want us to have as a foundation, okay? and. We spend a significant, a significant amount of time thinking about this one uh, because we, I saw and we experienced some uh, other approaches where I believe they were not as successful as this one is. So uh, the first one, and I think it's the most important one, um, is that the master branch basically is the single throw truth. The network device doesn't own that role anymore, the, the config that the device. If, if you want to know how the device and the production level is configured, you need to look into the master branch. And that's basically the single source of truth. And that become one of the key principles here. Um, um, and obviously you need to build around, you know, safeguards and, and, and process in order to, to maybe make this uh, achievable. Uh, but I can tell you it is achievable, okay? And our experience for more than a year show that. Um, the second one, uh, which, which is also very important, is that we decide to start with a minimal level of abstraction. And by this, I mean that if you look into our, our properties file, the YAML file, basically it's very specific. Uh, there's no, we're not hiding things. Basically, if I say the IP of the interface is whatever IP I'm, I'm thinking about or what you, we're considering, that IP is defined on that YAML the MTU, the BGP neighbor, what BGP group or policy is using, et cetera. So it's very specific. It's, there's no much abstraction at that level. And um, we thought about this because we didn't want to overthink things. At the same time, we, we didn't want to add a abstraction that are very specific to write direct at the start that could make it more difficult moving forward if other teams want to use the same you know, idea or concept. So I think this particular uh, play very well at the end, and I can show you some some um, some scenarios where we actually really like how it's working right now. Um, the third one uh, is something that unfortunately not many vendors support it, but uh, if you're using a vendor that support it, it make a big difference, which is um, full configuration replace. Um, and by this, basically, what it means is that when we generate a new config. We generate the whole config of the device. Even if I'm changing the IP of the interface, I generate the whole config. And I push that conf candidate config to the system, and then we basically replace whatever it has. Uh, there are system vendors out there that are very smart, and they basically uh, make sure that only uh, things work the way it should be in terms of uh, replacing a full config. Um, and, and again, this brings a lot of benefits. Uh, you can play or you can work with a, comp a vendor that actually support this. The other two basically are with the idea of we want to leverage what Riot already is using. A lot of other teams are Riot, you know, the people that are developing the game, the client, uh, that, you know, the social experience, everything is through go through our CI CD pipelines and our GitHub for source control. So we say we're going to leverage those systems. We don't want to reinvent the wheel. So this helps us significantly because now basically our infrastructure is managed exactly the same as people are managing their application or the you know their source code. Um, and last and not least, uh, we leverage a lot of open source projects. And well, I say a lot, but it's not actually the main ones are Nornir, uh, Napalm, and Kapirka for ACL management. Okay. 
So this significantly help us, you know, speed up the development and the the maintenance of the of this project in particular. So looking how the architecture looks like. Um, so this is basically um, how how this system looks like today. So we have a, in a repo basically these uh, the core system components, which is this is what uh, Nornir uh, and APAM is playing uh, at this at this layer. We have the network inventory of the whole infrastructure that Nornir basically consume in order to to identify okay where should I run this task or this you know the loading config or generating the config and pushing that config etc. We also have the configuration templates um, of the device vendor that we are using and the different kind of um, uh, properties uh, that match the property that we have for, for the device. Um, we obviously have the device properties like BEP interface, et cetera. And, um, and also we also have, we also have these specific tools that assist engineers on on updating or creating these device properties. For example, a pop build tool, peering tool, ACL checker, all these, we have this standalone application that at the end of the day are to assist the network engineers so they don't have to deal with the YAML directly, but you know, there's a, 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 a piece of code that help them do that, okay? Um, if you look into closer to these properties, and this, this is something that I would like to, uh, I mean, this YAML file are just how we want VGP to be defined for the device, interfaces, MPLS, route policies, BRF, et cetera, right? You can have as many, this is how we decide to structure first, but obviously this, uh, we can change this uh, in the future. One in particular one that I think that was a good uh, definition from the start in terms of the design is this exception YAML file. The exception is not anything less than a, like a catch-all scenario where I don't have a YAML, the Jinja, I don't have any define a Jinja to basically match the YAML and generate config. So if someone need to basically, and we want to keep the master branch to basically um, match the production network, we have the exception where engineers can put in that exception file just the raw config of something that, for example, is not supported today. Uh, the benefit of that is obviously you have a, a place where you can track the exception that you have in your network. And for example, our, our policy is kind of, if I'm adding an exception, I'm responsible to remove that exception, okay? If that was a temporary config because there, there was a, a, a tag case uh, working with, with the vendor to fix something or to, you know, to patch something as a workaround, I can remove that. I'm responsible for that. Uh, but also, if those things became permanently, then those are the ones that we need to come up with in terms of design to add it to the Jinja templates in the next release, okay? So the section uh, came very handy, uh, and even when we don't want to encourage engineers to use it, but it's there for those cases. And it's, it's good to have that flexibility, actually, okay? Looking more closely to the actual property, for some of these cases, a PGP, as you can see, just, I'm confirming a BGP group, you know, with, with neighbors and IPs and S number, et cetera. So all those things are part of the property file, okay? And 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 the good thing, we can track every single piece or change that happened to this file, okay? Via the source control. Now, um, how, um, in terms of the device property or the device model, we have, it's, it's based on the device property itself and the, template of that vendor. On the template side, we use what we call versioning. We are versioning that. And this is also something that became very, very useful because now if I want to add um, a new functionality, network functionality, imagine like, I don't know, segment routing or IPv6, I can say, okay, on version 1.1, this is the feature, network feature I'm going to release. And these are owned by the network team, not by tooling or by, you know, automation team. These things, these cycle are owned by the network team. The network teams say, I want to release this new feature in my network, but in order to release that, I need, you know, um, to update the templates. Instead of updating just one template and making things more difficult in terms of rolling that out, 
they say, okay, I want to release a new version. Uh, we are working right now on defining how a workflow in terms of testing, unit testing, uh, that makes sense when network engineers are, you know, creating these new uh, Jinjas. Uh, but this has also become very powerful because now the engineers say, I want to deploy PV6, but I only want to deploy on these nodes. So on those nodes attributes that is part of the inventory, we define a, a um, attribute called version. Okay. And we say, I want this node or this router or all these sites to use version 1.1 or 1.2. Okay. And when we are, you know, during changes to that device, that device automatically will use that version of the template. So uh, again, this is something, those, one of those things that we thought from the beginning and uh, the amount of time that we spent thinking about this design actually is paying off. Um, I was mentioning about these uh, JMO files that are very descriptive in terms of the configuration that we want on the device. And this is one of those examples that I, at the beginning, I never thought how powerful this could this could be. Okay, and but now you have this visibility of, of the change that's happening at network, not only from the perspective of the user that make that change, but also the um, uh, the time, the day, the commit that was applied, the PR, etc. Right? It's like, I mean. Again, this is so powerful, and we never thought that engineers that, that it, this will be so helpful. Okay, until we start looking into this, and then someone say, "Hey, there's a change happening. Who made this change? Oh, this is not compliance." Okay, that was the tool. Oh, when that happened? Okay, we now we have very good tracking of the changes at this level. You know, very very high definition of those changes. Okay, um, not only that, obviously because we are using Gemmel, you can also add comments to this YAML to add more context, right? Uh, and maybe self-documenting some of these properties. So it become very, very powerful. Okay. So um, so you may wonder like how, how we push these changes into a network, okay? So basically, um, because we are working now with source control and we have, uh, and what the network engineer normally will do is they're going to create a branch and this branch will, mean, for example, making a new BGP neighbor or configuring a new interface. And when those, uh, when we open a PR for that branch, uh, comparing with the master, after we merge that, that branch basically uh, can be deleted, okay? So at the end, it's just, these are very short-lived branches when we're making changes, but obviously the master branch always going to maintain the current state of the production network, okay? Um, so I think it's one of the, in order to, you know, kind of try to explain to uh, everybody um, the benefits, for example, source control and, you know, CICD pipelines, I think it's important that I walk you through the workflow that we have today um, with this new paradigm, okay? So, and I think uh, uh, the amount of time that we spend trying to define this, really, really help us come up with an, something that is very robust uh, for different reasons that I hope that uh, I can basically uh, explain at the end. Um, so first, the first thing that the engineer normally do, it will go into uh, seeing his local repo, what is in the remote repo, okay? Just by doing a git pull. Uh, when that, when his master branch basically is in sync, sync with the remote repo, uh, then he can create a new branch for the change. I don't know, a new BGP neighbor uh, or shoot down an interface, whatever that is. He make that change in his local repo in that branch. He uh, stage those changes, commit those changes locally, and then they, he push those changes to the remote to the remote branch. Um, when that is um, when that branch is in the in, in the in the remote repo. Um, then he can open up PR, uh, pull request, okay? Um, that process alone will trigger a, or internal Docker Jenkins where that Docker Jenkins will spin off a Docker container where he will, you know, clone the repo, uh, run the code, the deployer code, you know, um, and that deployer code basically will say, hey, what file change? If those file changes are properties, then he will filter what device, we'll figure out what device he needs to target. 
And when he figured that out, then he will generate, he will load those properties, we generate new config, he will push that config to those devices with a dry run flag basically uh, on, okay? The main idea of pushing that config with a dry run flag on is because I don't want to commit those changes right now. What I want device is to report back, hey, give me a diff, you know, give me a diff between the candidate config that I'm sending you and what is running on the device. That diff, when it came back from the devices to the system, the system will automatically uh, post as a comment into the PR that diff, saying, hey, this is diff from the device. So obviously that diff become a very powerful tool where, and it's very, con it's consistent because, I mean, the fact you can argue that engineers can do that, you know, as part of the procedure, but in order to make it consistent, this is the way to do it. So now you have that comment, that diff back, okay? Uh, very simple. The other engineer can now peer review, validate the intent versus, you know, the diff. And if those make sense, the match, then we say, okay, I can approve this, this change. Um, at that moment, the engineer, the engineer, engineer can then, you know, commit that, uh, change it by merging that to the master brand. When we merge that, basically, we are deploying that new config now with the drive run flag off uh, to the target device, and we will get a final div just to verify that the previous div and the final one make a uh, match. If they don't match, uh, definitely that will raise a flag. Um, uh, because there's a scenario where imagine that someone make a out of band change during that process, we want to detect those, okay? And so this is a very important like closed loop uh, that help us kind of achieve our goals. Um, the other thing that is very interesting with this diff coming back is that we organically put in some safe rail where, for example, imagine that I receive a diff and someone put a out of band change to that device. In theory, my, that D will come with removing those changes that that, that other person put out of band, okay? So knowing that we say, okay, well, this is not what I was intended to, so there's something we're here. So uh, right now we don't have that uh, extra mechanism to say, hey, this is a change that those were pushed out of band by this person, but realistically those are not that difficult to add to the workflow, okay? Now that you have this closed loop. So very, very powerful workflow, in my opinion. Uh, it's been, um, the engineers have been uh, using this significantly and they are very happy with it, okay? But people say that it's better with a demo, okay? So let me show you uh, very quickly how this works, okay? Here we have obviously my repo on my, on my right. I have my properties on my top left of a device, in this case, BGP, and I SSH the device just to show you, you know, uh, that things match, basically. In this case, um, my BGP session is up, and I'm changing, I'm changing that BGP session, I'm tuning down that BGP session, okay? Uh, I make that change, I say enable false, I'm going to create a new uh, branch, as I mentioned before, um, after I create the branch, I can now stage that change, commit that change, and push that change to the remote repo, okay? Um, so this is basically standard kit commands, basically, okay, of the process. By the way, this is pre-recorded, but I want to do a live demo having all these internet connectivity issues. So, uh, no surprises. Um, so, okay. So at this point, okay, we got the branch and you say, GitHub will tell you, hey, do you want to compare and create a pull request? Okay, I'm changing that BGP session from true and uh, the enable flag from true to false. I will, uh, at this point, create that pull request. And at this point, it will happen what I mentioned in the workflow. You're going to um, send a, uh, uh, um, REST call to the Docker Jenkins, telling, hey, I need, uh, you need to run this, you know, pipeline. 
uh, we'll load that deployer, we'll load those uh, property file the, that, is, that are part of the repo. We'll load, it will load the device conf, uh, con, uh, property for that particular target, in this case is route reflector. Um, and, and he will push that config to device uh, with the dry run. Uh, what we expected right now is that the city will come back with a diff, okay? Um, we shouldn't basically shouldn't doubt that in that PGP session, okay? That should come very, very shortly. Here we go, here we have, uh, yeah. So as you can see, we're basically shooting down, uh, we're adding the shoot down command to that device. And this basically comparing the candidate config with running config, okay? Now, this there's something very important to mention here. At this point, if I'm okay with this change, I want to merge and push that change. The original proof of concept, we basically, in GitHub, you have this, um, the option to squash and merge that PR. But we don't want to do that because if you do that, basically you're merging, but at that point, you don't know if your final push is going to be successful, okay? So what we did instead, we used this uh, capability of GitHub to uh, use the comments when and we add this comment, this particular RNET deploy this, this is a particular keyword that we have in the system that going to be a payload to that Docker Jenkins that become part of that, where then is sent it to the deployer tool. And when they see that now, I'm going to deploy that config with the dry run flag off. And if I successfully um, push that config, then I will merge that. It will automatically merge uh, that to the master, okay? And, and obviously uh, this all is, is automatically and what I do expect now is to have like the final div after that is committed coming back so I can put as well uh, into the PR. Obviously adapt the engineer have the capability to validate the, the final div the, what is com was committed to device actually match the initial one that was based on the dry run. Okay. Here, here we go. Okay. So it does match, say, hey, the final config was applied, the routers result in the same diff before, so we are good to go, basically, we are happy. At this point, I can delete that branch, and basically that's it. And, and we can think I will check the actual status of the device uh, just to make sure that, that I shut down that BGP session, and you can see now it's in shut down, okay? You can see, I mean, this is very simple, but at the end, we are, I think, uh, in general, the way they are adopted and the way all these things come together, um, at the end, we want the engineers to adopt this. And the in order to collaborate that, uh, corroborate that, we basically can see the amount of changes that we have pushed into the network. These are basically PR that we have merged to master since September 2019 when we first release the system, okay? So since September 2019, we have more than 2,200 merge into master, which uh, compared to other system internally Riot, I don't think there's only other uh, that has this amount of changes happening in the, net, in the network, okay? Um, and again, now the engineers are very, they understand the process of, of source control, they understand Git, and they know that this repo has the, is the single source of truth, okay? So at the end, and I would like to share just a little bit what we are planning to do next. Uh, the thing that we are planning to do next is the couple core automation from the actual infrastructure as code. We want to implement network and uh, base linters like with Batfish where we can do checks uh, of the network changes and put those in the PR or maybe making the PR fail with those change, if those uh, checks doesn't pass, they don't pass. Um, we want to have end-to-end uh, -end monitoring of the pipeline, uh, more unit testing, a lot of more unit testing, and we want to hire more people in order to basically have a good team composition, network engineers, software engineers, and even system engineers, okay? Um, so yeah, I mean, if, if I want to summarize, these are the key points that I would like you guys to take with you. One, master branch always equal production. Um, 
the device configuration is basically this software source code that you are basically tracking via your version source control. Um, I will definitely start with a minimal level of abstraction. I would not put too much thought about the abstraction itself. That's something that you can add as you move forward. Uh, and definitely full configuration replace something that makes a big difference and simplify all the automation uh, logic, basically. And Git and GitHub provides so, uh, so much value in terms of accountability, visibility, and high history. And yeah, um, the, 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 the address I have is just to thank you for, for listening to me and, you know, spend these 30 minutes um, talking about this. Um, and these are my contact information in case you need to reach out uh, after for anything. Thank you very much.